Welcome to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry, a clinician's guide to the latest psychiatric research. I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. Each episode, I interview a leading psychiatric researcher about how their work is shaping clinical practice. Today, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Christopher Pittenger. Dr. Pittenger is a professor of psychiatry at the Yale School of Medicine and director of the Yale OCD Research Clinic. In our conversation, we talk about the biology and treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder, including novel potential treatments like psychedelics, glutamate modulators, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. We also talk about why OCD is so underdiagnosed and what clinicians can do to spot it. So I'm excited to have this conversation about OCD. And, you know, we know that it's fairly common affecting about one in 40 people, um, and yet it remains underdiagnosed. Can you talk a little bit about why that is? Sure. I think there's sort of two broad reasons. One is that, unfortunately, we are not training our, our practitioners particularly well for OCD. I can speak primarily for psychiatric training, um, but I think that this is true in, a, in, psych, in psychology training and other disciplines as well. I mean, a lot of early training happens in the hospital. Patients with OCD are rarely hospitalized, and if they are, it's in a specialty unit. And uh, just I, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't pop up as much as it should in outpatient training either. So, And this, this leads to a a sort of self-perpetuating cycle. It's underappreciated, therefore the trainer's underappreciated, therefore no one works to, to change that, except at places where there's a strong presence. You know, I'm certainly working at, at Yale where I, where I teach to make sure everyone is thinking about OCD, but I don't think that's universal. So I think that when, when mental health professionals are evaluating a patient, it's very common for us to see a patient is evaluated for depression or anxiety in, in very generic terms, not even, you know, real diagnoses. Uh, and it takes years before someone asks the right questions to get the OCD diagnosis. So I think there's a real, there's a lot of work to do in professional training to just get it on people's radar as something that they need to be asking about in every evaluation. So that's half of it. The other half isn't within professional circles, but rather in society at, at large. Um, and, and has to do with the specific, you know, the nature of the symptoms of OCD. So folks with OCD have these intrusive thoughts that make them very uncomfortable and feel unwanted, feel foreign in some way. But they almost always have really pretty good insight. They know that these thoughts make no sense. They might feel that they're contaminated um, and that they are in danger of starting a plague or whatever. They know that that is irrational. They know that it's an excessive fear. That knowledge doesn't do them any good. <laughs> you know, they, they, uh, that knowledge doesn't make the thoughts go away. In fact, it can be a, an additional source of suffering because of, it leads to the sense of being out of control of, of their own thoughts and mind. But because they know that these thoughts are irrational, because that they know that the behaviors, the hand washing, whatever the attendant behavior might be, will be perceived by others as excessive, they often hide those thoughts. And this leads to an underappreciation of what OCD actually is in society at large and for people to tend to not tell their families, not tell their providers what's actually going on, what's driving their distress. And there the answer is public education and, and advocacy. Um, and this is, I'll say, over the course of my career, over the last 20 years, this has gotten better. I think there is better advocacy out there. There is a better understanding of what OCD really is. Yeah, there, there's the piece of, you know, not wanting to admit to the excessive nature of the thoughts, but also um, the taboo nature of some of the OCD thoughts, right, as well, like harming other people, harming children, things that, again, the average person doesn't really know about with OCD, right? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you're right. Sometimes the, the self-consciousness, if you will, is because the thoughts are excessive or seem bizarre. But sometimes it's because they're taboo. Like, as you said, an intrusive thought of harming someone else, an intrusive thought of suicide, an intrusive thought of, of hurting children or intrusive sexual thoughts. These are quite common. And so then there's, yeah, this, the, the fear isn't so much that the thoughts will be, will be seen as bizarre or excessive, but that they'll be seen as, as repulsive uh, because of their taboo nature. So yeah, that, that also causes people to keep their symptoms to themselves and gets in the way of a proper diagnosis and treatment. Yeah, repulsive or even criminal. Um, you know, uh, I have a colleague who um, she went to a psychiatrist with intrusive thoughts and he actually like called her boyfriend and said she was a danger to him after, you know, talking about these intrusive thoughts. And that's obviously an extreme example. But, um, you know, we thought it was like kind of a duty to warn, even though she had intrusive thoughts about harm, had no intention of ever doing it. But um, I think 
you know, like you're talking about clinical training is really important. And you were saying, you know, for people to ask about it at, you know, for a psychiatrist to ask about it at initial evaluations, any other kind of things that you hope will happen in, is it just asking the questions or is it like, again, having it more part of the training? What other thoughts do you have to make psychiatrists more competent with both um, assessing and diagnosing OCD? Yeah, I mean, I just think it should be part of every evaluation. You know, we always ask about hallucinations. We always ask about suicidality. We always ask about, you know, paranoia or other evidence of psychosis. I think we should always ask about uncomfortable thoughts that come into your mind that are difficult to control and you wish would go away. It's easy. It takes five seconds. And I think that that should be part of every evaluation. And then, of course, you know, in someone with anxiety and depression in someone, it, it, it's, a, it's much easier when someone's checking all the time or washing their hands all the time. They're, then then people will think of OCD. But that only happens about, I don't know, 60% of the time that there are these obvious compulsions that, that trigger our, our, our pattern recognition and makes everyone say OCD. Just about asking the questions. Yeah. And, and one other layer that you know, comes up in a lot of the different diagnoses we're talking about on this podcast is, you know, with psychiatry, we feel pretty far behind with regard to like precision medicine um, or having any other ways to diagnose people other than self-report. Is there any promising research with regard to biomarkers or blood tests or um, other ways to kind of uh, like assess OCD in a more objective way? Unfortunately, as as I'm sure you're expecting, the short answer is no, uh, that we're a very long way from having biomarkers. There have been some interesting studies that have looked at, you know, brain imaging or blood tests or other things and looked to see if they have, you know, give any useful information. And the answer is almost always that no, they don't, that by far the most useful predictive thing that one can do is a good care, a good clinical interview and, and asking the right questions. Um, I mean, that is, the work is ongoing. The genetics is starting to accelerate with OCD. Now, we don't have clinically actionable genetic tests for anything in psychiatry, with the exception of some causes of autism. But that will come over time. Um, and I, I don't think that the genetics will ever diagnose OCD, but they may give a risk factor for OCD. And if, you have, if the genetic test tells you that someone is at a 20% risk of OCD rather than the population background risk of 2.5%, well, then that's your ears are going to perk up and you're going to be asked those questions a little more carefully. I don't think we'll ever get to the point that something like a genetic test replaces asking about symptomatology, but we may get to the point that it helpfully informs the diagnostic process. I think that's probably a little farther away with brain imaging. They're pretty robust brain imaging findings with OCD, but they're not nearly precise enough to be diagnostic. We can make statements about people with OCD as a group compared to people without OCD as a group, but we, we're pretty far from being able to make those, those statements at an individual subject level. So I think we have farther to go there. Speaking of kind of the origins of OCD, we don't know a ton about the causes, but we do know something about the neural circuitry. Can you summarize the current understanding of what's happening neurologically in OCD patients? Sure. There's sort of a canonical circuit that's been implicated in OCD by studies going back to the, actually all the way back to the 1980s to the birth of functional neuroimaging. And that's the sort of organizing principle that most people uh, thinking about the neurobiology of OCD apply. In recent years, it's become clear that it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, surprise, surprise. But, um, but the basic idea, the early, the early functional neuroimaging found that a, a network of structures in the corticobasal ganglia circuitry are hyperactive. They're too active in folks with OCD. And those are the orbitofrontal cortex. That's sort of the most robust finding. The anterior cingulate cortex, and then the caudate and putamen within the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And if you remember the, you know, basic medical school neuroanatomy, those, the, the cortex projects to the caudate and putamen, which projects to the thalamus, which projects back to the cortex. So that led to this idea that there's a hyperactive circuit running through the basal ganglia. And it turns out that the basal ganglia modulate emotion. They also modulate habits. So things, patterns of behavior that we get stuck in through repetition. And that can be good if the habit lets you do things automatically and skillfully without having to think about them too much. It can be bad if the habit's maladaptive and you can't break out of the loop. And so this idea came up starting about 20 years ago, that, that um, 25, that one thing that's going on in OCD may be that its habit's gone bad, if you will. 
Now, that basic idea of the, the frontal cortex leading to the caudate and putamen leading to the thalamus and back again and hyperactivity in that loop has some more recent data that supports it. We know, for example, that if you interrupt that circuit surgically, surgical treatment is used in the very worst, most refractory cases of OCD. And if you interrupt that circuit surgically at a couple different places, you can get therapeutic benefit in those about 50% of the time in those terribly refractory cases. So that's, and then we also know from some recent functional neuroimaging and using a, a measure not of activity or of size and shape, but of functional connectivity of how much different parts of the brain are talking to one another. That has you know, validated that there's abnormalities in the connectivity and how synchronized these regions are in OCD. All of this tends to get better with treatment. The hyperactivity gets, so, so there's accumulating, you know, there's further evidence that's accumulated over the years and decades that that there's something fundamentally right about that idea. But uh, there's also evidence for, there's new evidence for implication of the hippocampus and amygdala, which are in the temporal lobe, aren't part of that canonical circuit. There's evidence for implication of circuits in the, in the, uh, the insular cortex and in the parietal cortex, not part of that canonical circuit. So unsurprisingly, it's turning out to be a bit more complicated than we originally thought. But I think that, that core idea that you have this corticostriatal feedback loop that has become a little bit too active, too connected, too, too rigid, is an important contributor to what's going on. And you said with surgery, you can see changes here. Do you also see changes in maybe the speed of uh, the, the loop with exposure and response prevention treatment or SRIs? Yeah, well, the best literature there isn't looking at the connections, but just the activity. So yes, when you treat people with either cognitive behavioral therapy or SRIs and their symptoms get better, the hyperactivity in this circuit also gets better. And that's one of the reasons that we think that, it, that this is a, you know, a difference that makes a difference. And there's a few studies that have shown that over the years. There was a nice meta-analysis in 2017 that put all that work together. It was about, ended up being about 15 studies over the years. So yes, that, that appears to get the, the, the hyperactivity, the neural abnormalities appear to, to calm down. I do want to just re recapitulating something I said earlier. All of this is at the level of groups. You know, you do a, a group, you run some stats, you can find a difference. It's not at the level of individual subjects or for diet, which is what we would need for it to be diagnostic or prognostically useful. We're, we're working on it, but we're not there yet. Yeah. And, and with the understanding this about the neural circuitry, what does it really tell us about the nature of the disease and how does that inform treatment and ongoing research? I mean, again, I think that at this moment in time, I have to say the short answer is it doesn't. Um, I mean, the fact is that our, our treatments, the, the SSRIs and the medication treatments have been found through trial and error. And the, um, the cognitive behavioral therapies that are very effective came from a theory about extinction learning and inhibitory, inhibitory learning uh, that isn't connected to, uh, to the neuroanatomy. So as in most of psychiatry, we have these treatments that we stumble upon or develop because of a theoretical framework we discover that some of them work some of the time, and then we kind of try to reverse engineer and try to figure out how that makes sense. So there is a lot of thinking about, you know, what is serotonin doing in this circuitry? What is dopamine doing in this circuitry? There is new research suggesting that glutamate modulating drugs may be beneficial in OCD. We've done some work in that area. So what is glutamate doing in this circuitry? But I can't claim that our understanding of the circuitry has led to the treatment ideas. It's more the reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of going backward through, okay, we're seeing changes happen from the treatment, um, but not knowing how to go the other direction. Right. And obviously, the hope is that over the coming years and decades, that situation will change, that as our, as our understanding of the, of the circuitry, of the genetics, of, you know, the role of learning in the development of symptoms, of all, all these other aspects that, that my group and others are actively researching, the hope is that we'll get to a point where we can generate new ideas, new theories, and then test them. And we will get to new ways to help people, but we're not at that at that point yet. Yeah. And, you know, I know with SRIs for OCD, um, you know, a higher dose is typically recommended more than for depression or anxiety. Um, what do we understand about serotonin's uh, involvement with OCD? Yeah, the, the best evidence for a role for serotonin is what you just said, is that, that the SRI antidepressants are the best and first-line treatment, whereas other kinds of antidepressants don't seem to work, or at least haven't been shown to work. The evidence is, is excellent with SSRIs and with the older SRI clomipramine, 
But it's quite mixed with ESNRIs, uh, like venlafaxine. And it's negative with some of the other tricyclics, with lithium, with clozaril, with lots of other things that people have tried. It's weak with uh, mirtazapine. It's something specific about the SRIs. So that's the best evidence that there's a role for serotonin. Now, I do have to say that sort of from a, from a logical perspective, that's not very good evidence because we in medicine target treatments at things that aren't the core of the pathophysiology all the time, right? The best treatments for heart failure target the kidneys. You know, the treatments for infection are antibiotics. That doesn't mean the infection was caused by an antibiotic deficiency. And so the fact that serotonin targeting antidepressants are the primary pharmacological treatment we have is interesting, but it doesn't prove that OCD derives, you know, originally from some abnormality in serotonin. There have been some genetic studies that have looked at serotonin-related uh, genes, and there was some early signal that maybe those contributed to OCD, but it ha- doesn't seem to be panning out in the latest genetic studies, although our understanding of the genetics is immature and time will tell. And then uh, there's a little bit of evidence that serotonin levels in, you know, in urine or, or in CSF uh, are altered in people with OCD, but it's not consistent or compelling. Finally, there's some PET imaging studies that have looked at serotonin receptors, and there have been some positive findings, but then some non-replication. So it's hard to put together a story about, you know, serotonin abnormalities, deficiency, dysregulation being the cause of OCD. Maybe once our, as our understanding advances, maybe that will turn out to be true, but, but right now it's hard, to, it's hard to put together that story. Yeah, it's so interesting that kind of putting together the story in a reverse fashion, um, it sounds like that's what a lot of the research is is hoping to do is make meaning of the, okay, we're seeing that SRIs work at this dose, but we don't exactly uh, maybe know what the causal factors are there. And, you know, we do have great treatments for OCD. We have SRIs and um, ERP. But we still know that about 25 percent of cases are refractory to these best evidence based treatments. What is your theory as to why that is? Well, I think OCD, like most of our disorders, is just very heterogeneous. Mm. Um, I mean, the way I think of OCD, let me take a step back. So OCD is characterized by the by obsessions, by irrational or excessive thoughts that come into the mind unbidden and are perceived as distressing or, you know, troubling. And then those cause anxiety. If they didn't cause anxiety, then, uh, you know, then we wouldn't we wouldn't call them obsessions. They wouldn't be a cause of distress. Then people engage in some kind of behavior to manage that anxiety. Well, that's the most natural thing in the world. If you have anxiety, you know how to make it go away. You're, you're going to do that. And then unfortunately, that, that, that behavior actually makes the, the, um, the thoughts stronger. And the way that works is, the, so these irrational or intrusive thoughts, the, the dirty little secret is everyone has those. Like in survey studies where, you know, surveying usually undergraduate psychology students and saying, do you ever have intrusive thoughts that you aren't really under your control that cause you some distress? They seem foreign and you wish they'd go away. Do you ever have those? And 90% of people will say yes. And I'm pretty sure the other 10% are lying. So what's, what's different in OCD isn't the existence of the thoughts. It's the degree to which they're treated as powerful and important. And so when you engage in compulsions, when you take the thoughts seriously and allow them to control your behavior, you're you're basically confirming that they're powerful and important. And then you double, you you check, you wash your hands, you confess, you ask for reassurance, whatever the compulsive behavior may be, you feel better, that reaffirms that those thoughts were powerful. You let them control your behavior and that, that reaffirms that they're powerful, which means next time the thoughts come along, which they will, they're just that much stronger. So I think of OCD as being stuck in that loop, being stuck in that loop of intrusive thoughts that feel powerful and important, cause distress, control your behavior. You feel a little better, but that reinforces that the thoughts were powerful and important, round and around and around and around. Now, if you think of OCD that way, there are lots of ways you could get stuck in that loop. You could get stuck in that loop because your intrusive thoughts happen to be stronger than most people's for whatever psychological or genetic or developmental reason. You could be stuck in that loop because you have characterological predispositions that incline you to be more likely to treat the thoughts as powerful and important. For example, perfectionism or intolerance of uncertainty. You got to have things to be clear or a feeling of excessive responsibility for what goes on in the world around you. 
these are, you know, traits that all of us have to some extent or another. They vary in the population. And if you're out on the end of one of those distributions, if you have a lot of perfectionism, if you have a lot of intolerance of uncertainty, you're likely to be less able to just discount your intrusive thoughts and move on with your day. They're going to seem more powerful and important. Or it could be that some people have more dysregulated anxiety. So the thoughts are, anyway, and on and on. I can go around the whole circle and come up with lots of theoretical reasons why someone might have a predisposition to get stuck in this feedback loop. When you think about OCD that way, it becomes crystal clear that it's going to be heterogeneous, even if the final common pathway is getting stuck in this feedback loop. And even that, I'm sure, is an oversimplification, but that's one that I find useful. But even if that's true, there's going to be lots of different ways to get there, which makes it unsurprising that, different, that not everyone's going to respond to the same treatments. I suspect when we understand it better, we'll be able to parse patients out. I don't know, I won't say into different diagnoses or even the word subtypes is a little complicated, but different versions or flavors of OCD that will help us predict who's going to respond to what treatment. The dream that you've brought up a couple times of personalized or precision medicine, I do think that we'll get there. But I think that the, the heterogeneity and the high degree of resistance to existing treatments is because patients are just so different. Yeah, and it's interesting because Having treated OCD for a long time myself, you see that it's in some ways very homogenized, the presentation of the OCD itself, like, or the, the, the same kind of fears or concerns or, you know, excessive nature or the feedback loop that we're talking about. But it seems like there's something about the individual's relationship to the thoughts where it's, like you said, maybe a greater intolerance of uncertainty or um, like what we call like overvalued ideation, right? They're really bought in um, because the diagnosis itself, I feel like the more I treat it, the more it sticks out pretty clearly when someone has it. But it's about, it seems like the individual's relationship to the thoughts um, is where we see that difference and, and where I run into kind of difficulty in, you know, in treatment compliance adherence, um, et cetera, mm -hmm. uh, for patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so it's interesting, like the CBT tries to weaken the connections, like, like the cognitive portion is, is trying to attack the, the treating the thoughts as powerful and important. And the behavioral part is trying to weaken the connections between the behavior, the emotion and the, the thought, the emotion and the behavior. A different line of treatment, sort of a, an ACT or a mindfulness based approach to treatment is more about trying to recalibrate one's relationship to the thoughts. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Right. And so I think it, it's in, in, in terms of what you just said, it, it's interesting to think about, you know, maybe it maybe these I do think that these kinds of therapy, which I think can both be very effective. I mean, this, the, the ERP, the symptom evocation and response prevention has been better studied, but mindfulness is widely used, including in my own practice. I think that these can be parts of the of a treatment program, but they're they're fundamentally trying to do something a little different. One is about the connections between thoughts and behaviors, and the other is about the, the nature, the relationship to the thoughts, as you put it. And so maybe when we get a little better at parsing out different subtypes of OCD, maybe that'll be the kind of distinction that we'll be making in a systematic way when we make treatment plans for individual patients. Yeah, and, and the one thing we do know is that it seems to have this chronic nature. You know, most people endorse having some, you know, continued obsessions even after getting good treatment or doing really well in treatment. So I think both of these um, treatments really being kind of a lifestyle change mm -hmm. um, in, in that relationship to the thoughts that <clears throat> something that needs to be ongoing for the rest of their life. Um, and I know that that can be kind of overwhelming for patients, but I think for other patients, they've been like, oh, okay, this is something I have to deal with forever, hopefully to, you know, a lesser intensity at different times in my life, but um, realizing that these are skills and tools or medication that I kind of have to commit to for the long haul. And let's talk a little bit more about some of the medicines, especially um, you've been involved in studying some of these. So, and you mentioned it earlier, but can you talk a little bit about uh, glutamate modulators and, and what we think is happening with OCD here? Yeah, so just to, to recap, the first line treatments are the serotonergic antidepressants, the SSRIs, and then second line will sometimes go to the older drug clomipramine, which may be slightly better, um, certainly is, is better for some patients, but it has more side effects. So that's the first line. And then second line, sometimes they use dopaminergic drugs like neuroleptics. But as you pointed out earlier, we don't, you know, those together, we can get 60% of people better, maybe 70% of people better, and a, a much smaller fraction, much better to the point of remission. So there's a huge need for additional treatments. And um, some of that psychotherapy, um, but, but on the pharmacology end, um, there's been interest in saying, okay, maybe we're getting all the bang for the buck we can with the serotonin system, 
with high doses of SSRIs. So maybe we need to look elsewhere to other mechanisms and other systems in order to find um, other things, other ways to treat folks who aren't responsive to the first line. And so we got, yeah, we got interested and a couple other people in the field got interested about 25 years ago in the idea that glutamate modulation, that the neurotransmitter glutamate may be out of balance in OCD. The reasons to believe that might be true are complicated and it's not, it's not a clear cut yet, but I'll, there's a couple studies that have looked at cerebrospinal fluid from unmedicated patients with OCD and have found there to be elevated glutamate. There's a literature of neuroimaging studies using this technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which can get a snapshot of glutamate levels in the brain. It's a kind of a messy, inconsistent literature, but there's some studies there suggesting glutamate's out of whack in the corticobasal ganglia circuitry in OCD. And there's a little bit of a genetic signal that suggests there might be some glutamate modulating genes that contribute. So it's sort of, I call it weak convergent evidence. There's several convergent reasons, none of which is a, you know, definitive. But together, they, they build this story that maybe glutamate imbalance contributes to OCD. And so what we and some others started doing about 20, 25 years ago is taking drugs that are already on the shelf that modulate glutamate and trying and seeing, seeing if we get any benefit. Most psychiatrists aren't terribly familiar with these drugs because they're mostly developed for neurological conditions. Um, one of them is memantine, the Menda, used for Alzheimer's and probably familiar to many psychiatrists. The one that we have done the most work on is a drug called Riliazole which was developed for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, which is a nasty neurodegenerative disease that has nothing to do with OCD. But it just so happens that neurologists studying and treating that condition uh, had developed this drug called, called Riliazole. And it works to combat excessive glutamate in a couple ways. Uh, it, it encourages glial cells to sort of vacuum up the excess glutamate, kind of like enhancing it would be if this you're enhancing serotonin reuptake rather than inhibiting it, but we're enhancing glutamate reuptake. It also seems to block glutamate release. So it works in a couple of ways to sort of tamp down excessive glutamate. And we just started treating patients who were refractory to standard pharmacotherapy with a serotonergic med, some of them on dopaminergic meds, a lot of them in psychotherapy, and weren't getting better. We just started treating with this drug, and we saw some benefit. Um, up to maybe, in our first studies, maybe as much as 40% of people getting some benefit. And so that's led to an ongoing, uh, ongoing series of studies Currently, we're actually working with a uh, biotech company, Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, that is doing a large study, not of Riluzole, but of a Riluzole prodrug, of a, a something that a new drug that turns into Riluzole in the body. And that's still in invent. That's not widely available. It's not FDA approved yet. It's still in investigation. But it's sort of the twenty years later, the extension of this work. Now, glutamate is complicated. Something like sixty percent of the neurons in the brain use glutamate. Uh, it's involved in almost every circuit and system in the brain. It has lots of receptors. It has reuptake. It's, it's a very complicated system. And so there are lots of different ways to manipulate the system. Nemenda or memantine works in a fundamentally different way. An over-the-counter supplement called N-acetylcysteine that we've done some work on that may modulate glutamate works in yet another way. So, and there's a bunch of other, you know, glutamate agents out there that, that haven't been investigated as much in OCD. So, it's an example of what I was describing earlier, where we're just kind of trying things empirically. We don't have a refined enough understanding of what's going on with the glutamate system to develop a, a really specific or refined hypothesis of how best to intervene. We, rather, we're taking the tools we have and trying them, and some, sometimes with some hopeful sign. Yeah, and it sounds like it could be really promising um, in the future also because it's pretty ex the, the glutamate um, modulators seem pretty accessible. Like if you're saying you can get them over the counter at your at your uh, pharmacy, well, the one N-acetylcysteine, which is an antioxidant amino acid, that's available over the counter, and it looks like, I mean, the way I answer the question is, I think it has a weak benefit for some people, maybe, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but but on the other hand, it's cheap, it's available over the counter, it's really benign. I mean, the main side effect is flatulence, which is you know not not fun, but is something most people can live with. Um, and so I think there's little downside to trying it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, a magic bullet. The other drugs that I've mentioned, memantine and riluzole, are prescription drugs. They're not as widely available. Mm -hmm. And we're waiting kind of on the research um, outcomes there as well. Yeah. Um, just to, to pivot a little bit into, you know, um, ketamine, very popular with a lot of mental health conditions that people are very excited about. So uh, what do we know about with ketamine and OCD? 
Yeah, so ketamine is a blocker of a particular glutamate receptor, the NMDA receptor. And it was found about, I think the first studies were as men, more than 25 years ago um, here at Yale, completely serendipitously. It was found to cause a strong antidepressant effect. And the, the two amazing things about it were, first of all, that antidepressant effect happened quickly. And second of all, um, it lasts for at least a week or two in most cases after a single dose of ketamine, long after the ketamine is out of the body. Um, so those, that was a revolutionary finding at the time. And then over the last, you know, the subsequent couple decades, and especially in the last 10 years, as you say, this, is, this has taken off. People are very excited about it and it's being used clinically. And I think it'd be incredibly effective in, in severe depression. I think it could be life-saving in, in severe depression. Um, and it's been exciting to see that work move forward. It is a glutamate modulating drug. It works differently than the other ones I've listed. And so, yeah, the idea came up um, a while ago, 15 years ago, that, that we should study ketamine in OCD. And the two groups that have done the most work there are my own and then that of my colleague Carolyn Rodriguez at Stanford. And we've actually gotten somewhat different results. And I think it's because we're studying different patients. We did an early study where we tried ketamine using exactly the same protocol that folks use in depression. In people with really bad OCD, many of them on medications, many of them with, co with depression and other comorbidities, the sick patients who failed the first-line treatments and who desperately need something new. That's, the, that's the, the group that we tried. And it was disappointing. Um, those who had comorbid depression, their depression got better, and that was helpful, but their OCD really didn't to any uh, to any substantial extent. And we haven't pursued it very much because that first finding was disappointing in those sick and complicated patients. Dr. Rodriguez has, has taken a different tack and she's been treating patients who don't have comorbidity and aren't on any medications. So a good, sort of asking a sort of proof of principle, can it help question? And she pu she's published, um, published a study and then has some more data she's begun showing at conferences, so it's not published yet, suggesting that it can in nicely controlled studies. So it seems like it can help uh, in her hands some people, but mostly people who aren't on medication and, and um, you know, don't have the complications. Whereas our experience suggests that in the, the really sick people for whom we, we are most desperate to find additional ways to help, maybe it's not so helpful. So I refer people to ketamine when they have bad comorbid depression, really to target the depression. I don't generally refer people who are refractory and severe to ketamine specifically for the OCD. Mm -hmm. But for comorbid depression, yeah, for comorbid depression, it can definitely be, be helpful. Yeah, and it sounds like it could be another option for people um, with, you know, maybe mild to moderate OCD, which, you know, I think, you know, people with OCD don't, haven't had that many options, so maybe to feel like, okay, there's something else out there. Yeah. I mean, I don't refer those people to clinical use of ketamine yet because we have such good treatments already. The right, SSRIs right. Mm -hmm. for meds and co the appropriate cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think it's better to go to those really robustly proven treatments first mm -hmm. rather yeah. than going to ketamine, which in my mind remains uh, unproven. Though, though, as you say, promising in that, right. in that group of right. patients. Um, and speaking of something that people are even more excited about, um, and you are doing uh, work in this area, um, talk a little bit about psilocybin and what we um, think is the core, you know, connection with OCD and, and what your study is looking at specifically. Yeah, there's some, everyone wants to hear about psilocybin. Um, <laughs> yeah, so psilocybin, of course, is a serotonergic drug uh, found in certain mushrooms that uh, creates a, a, a profound psychedelic effect at, at high enough doses. Dissociation, dilation of uh, space and time, sense of, bound, of uh, you know, boundary dissolution and oneness with the universe, often a spiritual experience, often an experience that people describe as deeply meaningful. Mm. It also appears to have lasting benefit in certain psychiatric disorders. The best data out there is in depression, where there have been two large controlled multi-site studies. Data looks pretty good in alcoholism, and then there's small studies in a number of other conditions. So, yeah, we got interested in that um, about 10 years ago, eight years ago. And this is work that's really been driven by my colleague, Ben Kelmendi, who's a mentee now and a, now a faculty member here at Yale, who I've been working with for just over 15 years. And I have to say, just like everything else, the, the idea came from the fact that it appears to work in depression and the fact that we talked to some individuals who had tried psilocybin you know, illicitly and reported some benefit, and that made it look like it was worth trying. And there was also the first study of psilocybin and OCD was done by 
uh, Moreno at uh, the University of Arizona back in 2006, and, and he's he's doing some ongoing work. So there were these little pieces of evidence suggesting it might be a benefit and was certainly worth looking at. So we're doing the first placebo-controlled study of psilocybin in OCD, and we've shown some of the early results um, from that, and it looks promising. We're hoping to wrap up that study by uh, in the spring and and hopefully publish it before the end of next year, and then we're moving on to to next studies. So. I'm quite optimistic. And psilocybin is exciting in, exciting in some of the same ways that ketamine was, is that you take it once, you have this you know, odd day, and then, but then when there are benefits, those benefits appear to last for a long time, long after the psilocybin's out of the system. There aren't benefits for everyone, but when someone benefits, it appears to be lasting. And that's really exciting. If there was something that you could do once or once every three months or every six months or something like that, that would be a fundamentally new way of approaching, um, approaching treatment. Now, I have to say, you know, our first study isn't published yet. There's a couple other folks at Hopkins and in London and at Arizona who are also studying psilocybin and OCD. So I think within a few years, we'll have several small studies. Um, and I'm hopeful we'll be able to move towards a big one um, to, to really, you know, pin down, d- does it work and for whom, for what percentage of people and can we predict for whom? Um, it is early days. I can't claim it's proven. I can claim that we're excited about it. We, we, we wouldn't be doing the work if we didn't believe that this could be a benefit for some people. But I can't claim it's proven yet, so I have to stay tuned on the data. But, but the potential, the upside, if it, if it really does work, uh, is, is exciting. And it does seem like with, um, with psilocybin, there's this piece that I, I've heard about kind of through all the studies that it feels like people get some separation maybe from their thoughts or from... Um, kind of maybe their alcohol use or their depression, they kind of get the separation. Um, and to me, that sounds like that could be a really powerful piece of psilocybin for OCD because the thoughts feel so intrusive, so contaminating, um, can feel so intertwined with who they are. And maybe getting some of that separation could be part of the um, the, the powerful nature of the of psilocybin. I don't know. What are your thoughts there? I think that may be right. And I think it goes back to something you said earlier about the relationship of the person to their thoughts. It's interesting when we talk to folks who've come through our study and done well on psilocybin. So someone who does well on ERP will typically say, yes, I still get those thoughts. They're not as powerful as they were. I still don't like them, but now I have tools to manage them. <laughs> right? That's, that is, that's a success for ERP. And this is just anecdotes at this point, but what we're hearing from people after psilocybin is more along the lines of, yeah, I still have those thoughts. I don't really understand why they ever mattered so much, right? So it's, it's a recalibration, or, or I get this is just a theory based on a handful of, report, of, of patients' reports, but it feels like a recalibration of the meaning of the thoughts or of the relationship of the self to the thoughts, of the, um, the importance, the power and importance of the thoughts. They're still there. But their, their meaning, their importance has been, has been fundamentally recalibrated. And we're doing some work, like we have a long interviews with everyone. We're doing some qualitative research and narrative analysis to try to tease out these themes and get it a little bit beyond anecdotes so that we can start to develop more robust theories to try to explain what's going on and how it differs from the improvement that is seen with, uh, with other available treatments. I know you've done some work also with neurofeedback. Can you tell us a little bit about um, that work and and what it does, you know, what's the involvement with the orbitofrontal cortex? So this is another line of work that uh, unfortunately is, I think, promising, but not yet ready to be a, be a, a general treatment. But, but we're hopeful and we're still working on it. And it does go back. We talked earlier about how uh, we have all of this, you know, this understanding of what parts of the brain are hyperactive in OCD. But we, but that, that uh, knowledge hasn't led to any new treatments. Well, so the neurofeedback is actually an example of where we're trying (laughs) to get it to lead to a new treatment. I mentioned how there's hyperactivity in this circuit that connects the cortex, the basal ganglia, and the thalamus. Uh, And I mentioned that the orbitofrontal cortex, which is the cortex sitting right on top of your eyeballs, is the most hyperactive. It's, It's the area of the brain where hyperactivity has been most repeatedly robustly seen in OCD. And that hyperactivity goes down in conjunction with successful treatment. So we asked the question, okay, we know if we treat with SSRIs or CBT, that hyperactivity goes down as symptoms get better. What if we could figure out some way to make that hyperactivity go down? Would that be a treatment, right? Sort of, could, could we do that, that causal 
relationship in reverse. Now, we don't want to go, you know, poking needles into people's orbital frontal cortex, though, though, again, I mean, surgery is, it's not in the orbital frontal cortex, but surgery is a, an effective treatment of last resort in OCD. But we, we tried to think, is there a way to non-invasively, sort of more, more, more less, <laughs> less dramatically, modulate the, the function of the orbital frontal cortex? And that brought us to neurofeedback. So broadly, neurofeedback is a form of biofeedback. It's basically where I show you something about the activity of your brain on the video screen, and I say, I know that you can't volitionally control the, the activity of your orbitofrontal cortex, right? You look at me funny if I tell you to turn down your orbitofrontal cortex. But I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to, through trial and error, see if you can figure out how to move that line on the screen. <laughs> push it up, push it down. And it turns out, and this is just this fact is remarkable, it turns out people can learn to do that. They can learn to volitionally control the activity of their orbitofrontal cortex. Not because they can sense it, because they can proprioceptive the activity of, of the OFC, but because they, they're being shown it on a screen. So that's what neurofeedback is. And so what we've done, and this is work that is spearheaded by my collaborator, Michelle Hampson, um, also here at Yale. What we've done in a collaboration going back 15 years is um, we, we take people with OCD, we put them in the scanner, we show them their orbitofrontal cortex. And we tell them, you know, try to move the line. See if you can make it go up. See if you can make it go down. Some people can't. Some people can. And when they do, their symptoms get better in a lasting way that lasts for at least a few weeks. And it also leads to an interesting, if you will, rewiring of the brain. It changes the structure of how different parts of the brain are interacting with one another. So that's pretty exciting. The problem is, and this, this, uh, that, that controlled study in patients with OCD was just published this year after a lot, lot of work. The problem is the effect is pretty small. It's pretty variable between people and it's pretty small. And since the neurofeedback is hard, it requires lying in a, in a mag, you know, in an MRI machine for hours, which is uncomfortable. It's hard to do. We feel like before we can start to push that out to be a, a treatment that, that might be widely applicable, we got to figure out a way to make the, the effect larger. And we're mm -hmm. thinking hard about how to do that. Yeah, kind of getting the juice to be worth the squeeze, it sounds like. Yeah. I do want to say one other thing about neurofeedback, which is, so neurofeedback is actually a very general term. It's kind of like psychotherapy or medications, but you can do neurofeedback on anything that you can measure in the brain. What you need is a way to measure something in the brain that you think is associated with an illness, and then a way to nudge it or to, to measure when it, the thing you're measuring gets backed in the direction you want it to. So in our case, we measure the orbitofrontal cortex activity, and we try to nudge it back towards lower. Neurofeedback in general has been studied much more using EEG, not brain activity in an MRI machine, but uh, electrical waves, brain waves, using an EEG machine. Um, and so there is neurofeedback that's out there, and this is why I felt this was an important point to make. There's neurofeedback that's out there that you can pay people to, to you know, to, to do. Um, but it's almost all based on EEG. And there's some evidence that it can be helpful in attention deficit disorder, in, uh, you know, various other conditions. There isn't any evidence that EEG neurofeedback can be helpful in OCD. And the problem is, we don't have an EEG abnormality in OCD. As I said, you need to have something to measure and you need to know how it's abnormal and where you want it to be in order to, to give people feedback. And we don't know that in OCD. So I have had people come to me and say, yeah, I've tried neurofeedback. It didn't work for me in OCD. But the fact is they were trying a kind of neurofeedback that wasn't designed <laughs> to be helpful in OCD. So it's, it's important since neurofeedback is sort of up and coming less familiar than pharmacotherapy or psychotherapy, it's important for folks to know that it's a, it's a broad generic term and the details matter a lot in terms of what is the neurofeedback targeting and what's the method being used. And with my last question about treatments, can we talk a little bit about TMS, so transcranial magnetic stimulation? What do we know about TMS with OCD and uh, is, it, is it promising and, and what do we see for the future? Yeah, so TMS is a way of stimulating the brain in a focused way using not electricity, but fluctuating magnetic fields. And so the fluctuating magnetic fields um, then influence neural activity, uh, and then that, one hopes, can have some benefit. And like neurofeedback and like pharmacotherapy, TMS is a pretty broad thing because what it matters where you stimulate, how long you stimulate, what the nature of the stimulation is. So you can have 
wildly different effects on the brain and brain circuits depending on how and where and when you stimulate. And that's an important thing to realize. It's not, TM, not all TMS is created equal. It was shown some decades ago that TMS targeting the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can be helpful in depression. And that's well established that that, that can be helpful. Turns out that that kind of TMS doesn't appear to work very well for OCD. And so for a long time, there wasn't a lot of, con- there were some positive studies, some negative studies, but not a lot of convincing data. What's happened more recently is TMS protocols have been developed to target the deeper structures in the brain that are associated with OCD. So targeting the medial cortex, like right along the top of the head, seems to work a little better. And targeting the, the anterior cingulate, the deep medial cortex, uh, seems to work quite a bit better for OCD. And, but that requires different hardware. The original TMS machines used for depression can't do that. They can't target the deeper structures. There are two companies out there, one called Brainsway and one called MagVenture, that have developed TMS coils that because of that coil is a different shape and they've worked out the physics, can stimulate those deeper structures. And there's good evidence that those can be helpful in OCD. There was a particularly, the company Brainsway did a sham-controlled trial that was published back in 2017 that led to FDA approval of, of their coil and their protocol for the treatment of OCD. So I think that when it's done properly, I've, I have not done TMS research myself, but I've seen the data and um, I'm convinced by it. I think when it's done properly, it can be helpful. What's less clear to me is when to use it. TMS is a little hard to access. It's harder to access someone who know, who's doing it properly for OCD. This is another place where it's important to ask the right questions and make sure the proper coil and protocol are being used. Um, and when you can access it, the standard protocol is it requires daily visits, five days a week, for often six weeks. So that's a, a really burdensome uh, and, and fairly costly treatment. I do think that it can work. I don't know when to use it. I think that I, I still use SSRIs and appropriate cognitive behavioral therapy first before I even think about TMS. I don't know that they work better. Nobody's done that study. I do know that they are better proven with many studies, and they're a lot easier to, to access, especially the, the meds, obviously, are a lot easier to access for every patient. So I think there's still work to be done to figure out when the proper time to use TMS is. But I do think when used properly, the data suggests that it, that it can help. We've been talking a lot about this relationship even between or or maybe even, I don't know if it's a relationship or the um, the experience of both depression and OCD mm. with someone with OCD. Um, and it sounds like with um, some of the, the treatments, if they target what we think is impacting depression, it can help with the OCD. We also know people who, you know, go through um, exposure and response prevention, uh, their OCD gets better. A lot of times their depression gets better too. What's your kind of, what are some of your thoughts about this relationship between depression and OCD? Because even when you were talking about TMS, it sounds like, but there it seems like there's no connection, like with the coils for depression don't help OCD. Um, so, So what do you see as the relationship there with depression and OCD? I think it's complicated. I think there's several different forms the relationship can take. And when we see patients, who have, well, so first of all, I'll just you know, confirm what you said, that it, it's, the two do go together very often. About 40% of patients with OCD have depression. In the sort of more severe refractory patients, I tend to see that number is more like 75%. So it is common for the two to go together. It's common for, and, and often they get worse together, like under stress when the OCD gets worse, the depression gets worse. Sometimes I've seen cases where they go opposite. The OCD gets better and the depression kind of expands to fill the space and then vice versa. But more commonly, they go together. You can think of at least two different ways that that could happen. And I think both are probably true some of the time. One is they might have similar causes whether that cause is about serotonin dysregulation or glutamate dysregulation or stress or developmental experience, you know, whatever. They, they may have overlapping causes. And so the same cause may lead to both in the same people. Alternatively, we know that depression is often caused, triggered, or worsened by chronic stress and especially chronic uncontrollable stress. Well, chronic, persistent, intrusive, distressing thoughts are a pretty great example of a chronic uncontrollable stress. So it's very often the case, or at least it certainly clinically feels like the case, that the depression is a result of the OCD. And in those cases, you want to, you know, when the OCD gets better, the depression often will. 
So that's two different ways the two could be related to one another. And I'm sure there are others that one could come up with. And I'm sure that the truth is a complex mix of all the above and varies from patient to patient. I do sort of, you get a sense when you're evaluating a patient as to whether the depression is because of the OCD. And sometimes they'll just, they'll just up and tell you, they'll say, of course I'm depressed. This, this illness, you know, this OCD is, is destroying my, my relationships yeah. and my life. And so, <laughs> so wouldn't you be depressed too? Sometimes it's that. Sometimes they were depressed for years before the OCD started and it feels different and they don't fluctuate together and it feels like a different, you know, comorbidity rather than a result. And those impressions will affect how I plan treatment in individual cases. I don't know how to do that systematically as opposed to just on sort of the hunches that you develop when you're getting to know the complexities of an individual patient's case. Well, you know, I, I think we have more questions than answers, but I think it's exciting that all of this work is ongoing. Um, it seems like at this point, we you know, we don't have a silver bullet, but keeping an eye on the literature and the research that's forthcoming, um, there's some exciting things that could hopefully impact treatment um, in the next number of years. That's certainly our hope. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Dr. Pittenger, and thank you for being on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure to spend this time with you today. Thanks so much for that conversation, Dr. Pittenger. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to NYU Langone Insights on Psychiatry on your podcast app. For the Department of Psychiatry at NYU Langone, I'm Dr. Thea Gallagher. See you next time.